Hi, welcome. Thanks for attending our talk. This is Room for Escape, scribbling outside the lines of template security. So my name is Alvaro Muñoz, also known as Pond Tester in the social media. I'm a security researcher with the GitHub Security Lab, and with me, my colleague Alexander Miros, also known as Oleg Miros in Twitter, and he's security researcher with Microfocus Fortify team. So today we will be reviewing the security of content management systems or CMS. And basically, we will be focusing on the security of the template systems that are used by CMSs. Um, so a content management system is basically an application that is used to manage uh, different types of web content so that users can actually create, upload and publish different type of content. So normally, this content is based on some structure, some, some kind of documents called templates which are used to generate and create dynamic content. So these, these templates normally allow a subset of different uh, programming language capabilities. So they are powerful in the sense that they can be used to uh, run arbitrary code. Because of that, they are normally sandboxed in order to prevent uh, arbitrary code execution and remote code execution. Uh, so our research will focus on both .NET and Java based uh, content management systems because these are the, the languages that are more prevalent across enterprises. And our assumption is that um, the attacker can control the templates, right? So uh, we don't really care about how the attacker get control of these templates in the first place, if it's through a server side template injection, or if it's maybe through our cross site scripting that allows him to submit arbitrary templates in the in behalf or of someone else, or maybe they have permissions, like uh, if you are a user, for example, in SharePoint, if you have a, an account in SharePoint, you are allowed to create your own uh, sites and, and content. So no matter how the attacker can um, edit the content of a template, uh, our research will focus on uh, escaping and breaking all the mitigations put in place to prevent arbitrary code execution. So, we will uh, first start with .NET. Um, basically, we will focus on, on SharePoint. We will present five different ways we were able to break um, the sandbox used by SharePoint to prevent arbitrary code execution. And then we will move into the Java part where uh, we will present four different uh, template engines, including the most popular ones such as Velocity and FreeMarker. And then we will present 10 different content management systems, and we will try our bypasses on them. So we will wrap up with some takeaways and conclusions and then open the floor for Q&A. So let's start with the .NET part. Thank you, Alvaro. In this part of our presentation, we will present different types of security problems in content management system and give example of them in SharePoint. But before that, we need to explain some basics of SharePoint security. SharePoint has two types of ASPX pages. The first type is application pages. Each of these pages are the part of SharePoint server and implements some application logic. They are stored in specific folders on the file system. Of course, users are not able to change them. They are regular ASPX pages and are processed by server without any restrictions. In opposite to them, there are site pages. They are stored in database and they can be customized even by users. SharePoint parts of them in special mode, also known as safe mode. Actually, they are more like some sort of templates for presenting dynamic content. On this slide, we can see a diagram how server works with this page. Virtual provider can fetch content from file system or database. Based on the virtual path of the current page, a speed page parse virtual will decide either it is site page and safe mode should be applied, or it is an application page and it will be processed without any restrictions. So page filter is critical element from security design. Let's have a look on simple of a ASPX page. For our attacks, we are only interested in server side components. For example, directives. There are special instructions on how server should process the current page. Often they have some number of attributes. We can include server-side code either in special blocks or as embedded server-side code. To be processed by server, control should have the runot server attribute. The next hour element is server-side uh, common block. It is ignored by server. 
and server-side include directives allow us to include raw content of arbitrary file. Now we can better understand what safe mode means. Site page will not be compiled, so we cannot use server-side code. We are not able to include files from file system. We can only use allowed controls. This list is defined in safe control section of web config file. Page filter also applies an allow list for directives and even for attributes of most of them. There are many other restrictions. For example, event binding is blocked as well. As we can see, it is a set of quite strong restrictions, how it can be bypassed. As we know, safe mode is enforced by page filter. So our first question was, is there any place where SharePoint does not use it? And answer yes, there are such places. Page filter will not be applied for the content argument of the parse control method. If it's called only with one argument, or if the second one that actually has name ignore parse filter is true. In addition, page filter is used at rendering time, but is ignored at design time. But even if page filter is not applied, SharePoint uses another way to verify the input. It is a verify control on safe list method from editing page parse type that aim to do the same task as the original page filter, block markup with unsafe elements. But let's imagine for a second that we are able to bypass either this method or page filter. By the way, each such bypass is separate vulnerability and we will present them in a few minutes. So how could we get remote code execution after escaping into the safe mode? Remember, since parse control uh, method never causes compilation, we are not able to use server-side code or perform any other attack that require uh, compilation. But if we escape uh, safe mode, we can use unsafe controls or directives. Let's review several of them. One of the most interesting, interesting unsafe controls is object data source. It allows us to invoke public methods from arbitrary public type. We can see an example of payload that uses start method from process type to launch calculator. So actually it is arbitrary code execution, jackpot. But let's review a couple other and safe controls. XML data source and XML controls allow us to get content of arbitrary XML files. The similar results we can get by server site include directives that return us content of any text files. Let's see how we can escalate from arbitrary file read to arbitrary code execution. If we can access web config file, we will be able to get validation key from machine section, key section. By the way, this value may be present in other places such as internal SharePoint properties. We will see this example a bit later. With validation key, we can generate a valid, valid view state that will execute arbitrary code com commands on the target server. We can use tools such as use of serial.net for this. Now, when we know what safe mode is and how we can compromise SharePoint server if it is bypassed, we can move to our next part of this talk. Here we will present five different types of security problem in content management system. We will show examples of each type in SharePoint. We would like to stress here that our target is SharePoint server with default configuration. All vulnerabilities allowed us to execute arbitrary code on the target. And all attacks were performed by regular user. No admin rights were needed. Let's start. The first type of security problems in it is access to resources with sensitive information. It can be configuration or business information in various files, logs, database, or even process memory. Of course, proper sandbox should prevent this problem, but it is not always the case. We already mentioned that page filter blocks server site includes directives. And verify control on safe list method should do this as well, and actually it does. But if it's called with false in block server site includes argument, it will not block them. And we found such usage of this method. It was used for design mode. The next building block for our attack, how we can provide our markup for this mode. We can send it in web part xml parameter of the render web part for edit method of the web part page services so we can try to include web config file there 
Here we can see the full payload for the mentioned parameter and address to relevant web services. Server returned us the entire web config with validation key. We used it for view state based deserialization attack, which led us to uh, executing arbitrary OS command on the server. Time for our next type of security problems in content management system. Allow dangerous element that can be used for attacks. We have found an example in SharePoint safe control list. Or should we call it not so safe control list in this case? It is contact link suggestion micro view control. We can see snippet with interesting code from its implementation where request parameter is passed to data set uh, read XML method. If we can control input for this method, we can get our data deserialized by XML serializer with control type. We already showed in one of our previous uh, work that in this case, we can get arbitrary code execution. Unfortunately, this payload is too big for slides, but you can find it in our white paper. The last piece of the puzzle uh, is our site page with this dangerous control. You can see it on this slide. For the attack, we just need to place the payload into the text box and click on submit button. And desired command will be executed on the SharePoint server. For us, the next type of security problems looks quite interesting. So we will explain it with more details and present two separate examples from SharePoint server. Dynamic content usually means that we will have at least read access to some properties or attributes of some objects. For some system like SharePoint, we can even write values there. Of course, Sandbox should filter out the access to dangerous property or attributes. Let's review basic type of such filtering. The first case is when only one level of properties or attributes is allowed. We can see examples on the slide. Name property of user object of select value from menu. We can imagine the object and its properties like a branch with only leaves. If an allow list is applied, it's relatively easy to review all elements. And after such review, we can make sure that there is no dangerous elements. What if block list is used instead? We still need to verify available objects and it can be a bit difficult. So in general, we do not consider a block list a safe approach because of potential uh, gaps there. We will see in Java part a couple of examples of such bypasses. The most interesting case for us is when access to nested properties or attributes is allowed. For example, request.authuser.name or menu.selectedItem.text. Because of branch leaves analogy, many developers may imagine this case as branch with branches and leaves and they may apply a filter only for the first level objects. But it is not true. It is network. And we may jump from one branch to another branch or even to the trunk. For example, on the slide, we can see how we can access application instance from a new web control. Let's illustrate this problem by examples from SharePoint. There is wiki content web part control. It is allowed and can uh, pass our markup into the parse control method. Please note, it is called with false value in ignore parse filter argument. So page filter will not be ignored. The fol following snippet shows that in this case, the virtual path will be created from up relative virtual path property. And if you remember, page filter will apply restriction based on this virtual path. So if we are able to change it, we can fool the page filter to not apply any restriction to our markup. Let's try to craft such payload. First snippet fails because when ASPX parser tries to assign a new value to up relative virtual path, the page property of our control is not defined yet. So we need to delay this assignment a little bit. We can do this by data binding. So by the time the property is bound, the page property will be already defined. Here is our final payload. We can notice that our new path points to uh, application page setting ISPX. It is assigned to tooltip property and later will be transferred to up relative virtual path. So the page filter will think that this is system page and will allow any unsafe markup. For example, we can use object data source control to start calculator. Let's see how the real attack may look. We can see a site page with our payload. 
path to system page, it will be assigned to upper relative virtual path. Uh, in safe markup contains subject data source control. Uh, we will invoke start method of the process type and we'll start calculator. Let's save it here. For our attack, we need to upload it to the target server. In our case, it's SharePoint with default configuration. That means a regular user have access to their own uh, personal sites and we can use them to host our site page. We are notificated as regular user with name attacker Sneaky, isn't? And uh, here is his personal site. Let's upload our page here. Now, to trigger our attack, we just need to click on it. But before that, uh, let's take a look on the right slide of our screen. Uh, we can see task manager on our SharePoint server, and we will notice if calculator start. Now let's start. Uh, let's start our attack, and here is our calculator. Let's move to our next vulnerability in SharePoint. Now we will try to exploit read access to nested properties. We will use control parameter. It allows to bind value of property from another control to select prop parameter. Also, it support nested properties. We need to deliver value of target property back to us. To do this, we will use XML URL data source control that sends a value of select parameters to external server. Now we need to uh, find accessible property with sensitive information. Here we should explain a little bit configuration process of SharePoint online servers. Obviously they are installed and configured automatically. But what about configuration parameters that are unique for each installation? They will be provided in special file that will be used for unintended configuration. What is important for our attack? All such parameters, including validation key, will be stored in initialization setting property. So we just need to find a path of nested property to it from any allowed control. And here it is. Here is the whole page that will send value of validation key to attackers.server.com. With this value, we successfully got arbitrary record execution by unsafe deserialization in view state. Now let's move to the next type of security problems. It is connected with our previous work on unsafe deserialization. Such kind of problem are relevant when text or binary data is converted to an object and the type or class of this uh, object is under attacker control. Plus, it is not properly limited. Actually, it doesn't really matter what mechanism is used. Classical deserializers, JSON and Marshallers, type converters, or even some custom approaches. All of them are potentially dangerous. For successful exploitation, attacker just may need to find proper gadget on the system. We have found examples of such problems in SharePoint and were able to perform arbitrary record execution attack using it. But patch is not available yet. So we are going to publish all details of this problem when fix is released. The last type of security problems in this part is the classical time of check to time of use problems. They occur when the server invalidates some input, but this input is later changed before the server uses it. We have found such problem in web part editing surface page. User input is validated by the already mentioned verify control on safe list method, but later the server may modify the input and remove substring that match specific regex uh, pattern. Let's look on the next input. For validation uh, control on safe list, it is just one server side common block, so it will pass validation. But SharePoint removes the highlighted yellow substring and parse control will see two comments and some markup. No, parse control has only one argument, so page filter will be ignored. Time for our payload. We can notice our unsafe object data source control and calculator command. In this part of our talk, we saw multiple ways to achieve arbitrary record execution on the SharePoint server by regular user. These vulnerabilities reveal five different types of security problems in content management system. Now let's switch back to Alvaro and we, he will present even more vulnerabilities with templates for dynamic content in different Java frameworks and products. Thank you, Alexander. So switching to the Java part, 
We will be reviewing four of the most popular Java template engines, including um, FreeMarker, Velocity, Pebble, and JinJava. And also we will be reviewing 10 different content management systems that are using these um, engines. And then we will be trying our bypasses on these content management systems. So a brief introduction into what template engines are. Basically, these are systems that take two different inputs. One is the template where we are mixing static and dynamic expressions and also the template context where we store objects uh, that are required by the engine in order to resolve the dynamic expressions in the template. So for example, here we have the user.name expression. In order to resolve it, we need to get access to the user object in the context and then invoke the getName method. So because it's invoking Java methods, it's basically uh, dangerous in the sense that attackers can execute arbitrary Java code. And that's the reason why most of them are sandboxed in order to prevent arbitrary code execution. So apart from the objects that are normally and directly used by the template, um, there are a number of other objects that are exposed as part of a template API that is normally uh, provided by the uh, content management systems. We, uh, which basically um, provides objects such as, for example, the request, uh, the response, the servlet context, or even the HTTP session. So those objects are available in most of the uh, template APIs and also many more that are part of this uh, API. So we will be discussing first um, some generic bypasses. That means that are independent of which engine is used, no matter if it's a free marker, velocity, Pebble or Java. Right, so those bypasses are um, based on finding different objects that we can use to get arbitrary code execution. So we need to inspect the template context and look for these kind of objects. So in order to do that, if we have access to the JVM, we can basically debug it or we can instrument it, dump the template context and inspect and anal analyze all the objects in there. However, if we don't, if we don't have access to the JVM, uh, we will have to read the template API documentation, maybe do uh, some brute forcing in order to guess names like, for example, request or rec or response resp and things like that. And also in some of the engines, like for example, FreeMarker, it is possible to list all the variables or objects that are exposed in the context. So apart from those objects that are directly exposed to the, to the uh, context, we have some objects that are indirectly exposed. Like for example, if we are exposing the HTTP session because it contains some attributes, all of those attributes will be available for the users and attackers to, to access and use. Same thing with the servlet request and same thing with the servlet context. So those are stores of attributes, stores of objects that the attacker can get access to and use to look for interesting objects. So let's see how many objects we can find in one simple content management systems. In this case, it will be LifeRay. And in order to do that, we will be uh, generating this template um, that I'm showing you, which basically is listing all of the uh, context, context variables, then all of their request attributes, then we will show all the request, uh, sorry, the session attributes, then the servlet context attributes. And because the servlet context will expose the um, Spring framework context, we will be also listing all of the Spring bins, all the objects uh, registered in the Spring context. So if we render that, um, you will see that we have a bunch of objects directly exposed to the context. Those are part of the template API, and some of them are very interesting. Others are exposed as part of the request attributes, uh, session attributes, and servlet context attributes. So as we can see here, we have interesting uh, objects like an instance manager, or for example, the um, web application context for Spring that we use to list and access all the Spring base. So, as you can see, there are hundreds and thousands of objects here. There is a total of almost 900 objects. And because of some of them will have public fields that we, we can get access to, then this number will increase to thousands of objects. So back to the slides, uh, this is why we, we call it object dumpster diving, because this is how we felt 
when I'm um, trying to find very few interesting objects uh, that can lead to remote code execution uh, among uh, you know, thousands and thousands of, of objects. So now we will be reviewing the top three um, objects that we found that lead to remote code execution. So the, for example, the first one, the class loaders, was uh, available in 10 out of the 10 content management systems that we analyzed. So uh, normally you can get access to this class loader instance through uh, the get class loader method in the class um, type, but that is normally blocked by the, any block list by any uh, sandbox. So you can still get access if you get access to a protection domain or a self-led context as we saw before. So once that you get access to um, a class loader, you can obviously uh, load arbitrary classes and then also load arbitrary resources from the class path. But apart from that, uh, you get access to a URL object and then from there you can um, access any file from the file system that the application server ha has permissions uh, to access. So here uh, you have an example, you get the URL using the get resource method and then you point the URL to the uh, password file and then you open a connection and read the, all the bytes from, from that file. So um, apart from the standard web, uh, class loaders, because uh, content management systems are normally um, deployed on top of self-led containers or application servers, uh, the instance of the class loader that you will be able to access is normally an instance of a web application class loader that are uh, slightly different because of the way that uh, class loading delegation work, but also because they expose a number of additional methods that are not part of the abstract uh, class loader class. So here are just some examples. Um, just mention because we don't have time to cover them in this talk, although uh, it's explained in the white paper that we are uh, publishing as part of this, uh, this talk. Uh, there are different ways of using these methods in this web application class loader to get remote code execution. Just to mention some of the, of the, of the vectors, we will be able to upload web cells, um, instantiate arbitrary objects, perform JNDI injections, or even um, initialize um, attacker control classes. So we, are, we were able to, found, um, to find sorry, um, web application class loaders in nine out of the 10 content management systems that we analyzed. And then the second object, the most, uh, second most uh, easy to find object in this um, template context was the instance manager or, or the um, object factory. So this was found in nine out of the 10 content management systems and is normally found as part of the self-led context attributes, but also it can be accessed through one of these web application class loaders. So if you get access to an instance manager, what you can do is basically instantiate arbitrary types. So with that, it's very easy to escalate to remote code execution. We, uh, here we have an example using the script engine manager, but there are a bunch of classes that can lead to remote code execution once that you can instantiate them and then um, invoke arbitrary methods on them. So the number three object was um, a Spring application context. It was um, only available in four out of the 10 CMSs that we analyzed. Uh, actually, the only four that were using the Spring framework underneath and is normally accessible through one of the self-led context attributes, but also uh, if the content management system is using um, a Spring MVC framework for the model, controller, and view layers, then um, a Spring will inject some additional objects in the template context, like this Spring macro request context that will um, provide access to the Spring application context. So once that we have access to the Spring context, we can get an instance of a class loader and initiate a class loader based attacks like we saw before. We can access the Spring environment that will give us access to the system environment and also the system properties and also uh, Spring properties, including things like encryption keys and so on. But pro probably more interesting, it will give us access to the Spring bins registered in this Spring application context. So being able to access and manipulate those pins, we can basically control the application logic and do things like uh, register new users, uh, delete users, perform transactions, anything that the application is normally doing. So that's normally behind an authorization layer. So no matter what roles we have, we will be able to perform and um, uh, this kind of application logic control. 
So uh, apart from that, we will also be able to disable the template engine sandboxes if we, if we are able to get access to the template engine configuration pins and also instantiate arbitrary objects like we will see later by accessing JSON or XML and Marshallers. So uh, those were like generic bypasses independent of what template engine was used uh, underneath. And now we will be reviewing some specific sandboxes bypasses for each of these four different template engines. So we will start with FreeMarker because it's probably the most popular one. And also because, uh, well, it was analyzed and uh, researched by different researchers in, in the past. Like for example, James Kettle back in 2015 when he presented server-side template injection um, vulnerability class. Uh, by the way, if you haven't watched this talk, it's highly recommended. He presented a bypass that is um, based on a kind of add-on or module that is deployed on the default configuration of FreeMarker. Um, so Tony Torralba last year presented a different bypass, but this one is not universal in the sense that it depends on a non-default configuration of FreeMarker and also uh, being able to find gadgets in third-party libraries that may or may not be available in a specific target. Uh, then Ryan Hanson uh, this year, probably at the same time that we were doing this research, presented a vector that leads to remote code execution by uploading a web shell, but this is not universal in the sense that it only works with Tomcat servers. So FreeMarker Sandbox is a method-based block list, which basically means like that, for example, methods like the getClassLoader method in the JavaLang class is blocked and you cannot get an instance of a class loader using this method. But as we mentioned before, you can still use the servlet context or the protection domain to get access to these uh, class loaders. Once that you get access to a class loader, the class loader methods are not blocked by the block list. So you can still uh, interact with them, uh, load classes, get resources or initiate remote code execution attacks that we saw before. And also reflection is uh, forbidden to set fields values, but is allowed to get and read field values. So we use that uh, to perform an attack, but this attack is not universal in the sense that it depends on being able to find an instance of a URL class loader. So this is normally the case in Tomcat, Glassfish, and Jetty, but it's not universal for other uh, application servers. So in this case, we are basically getting the URL class loader from uh, the protection domain or from the servlet context. And then we are basically uh, instantiating uh, by invoking this new instance method, a new URL class loader that is pointing to the attacker control jar file, in this case, the pawn.jar file. Once that we get access to this class loader, we can get a uh, load arbitrary classes from our own um, jar file, and we will be loading the pawn class. And now uh, the class is loaded, but it's not initialized. If we want to run uh, arbitrary code, we need to initialize the class. We cannot instantiate the class. We cannot invoke static methods. So those vectors, those ways of um, initializing the class are not uh, a possibility for us, but we can um, get access to public static fields. So just by adding a public static field and getting access to that, the class will be initialized and the payload will be executed. So that was not a universal bypass in the sense that we are required to find a, an instance of a URL class loader and we want to find something that works no matter if we are able to find that kind of class loader or not. So we are interested in finding some classes that contains public static fields of a given type which contains a method that we can use to instantiate arbitrary types. To find them we use CodeQL which is a language that you can use to query your uh, source code in the same way that you use, for example, SQL to query um, a database. And what we uh, wrote was this query that basically says, okay, find me all the public static fields, which are of a given type that can instantiate arbitrary types. Um, we ran this query on free marker source code and we found four different results. Those are um, four different fields of different types, but all, uh, all those types extend from the beans wrapper type, which contains a new instance method, which we can use to instantiate arbitrary types. Now, uh, this is the universal um, remote code execution bypass um, for FreeMarker. Basically, we need to get us access to any type of class loader from either the protection domain, servlet context, 
uh, and then load the object wrapper interface and get the default wrapper field from this interface. And then we can use that to instantiate arbitrary classes. Uh, since we want to have this payload basically contained in, in free market classes, we are using the execute class in order to run arbitrary system commands. But you can use other payloads, other classes to get arbitrary code execution. So this was fixed in version 230 of free market. And also, if you get access to the spring bins uh, and you can get access to the free market configuration, as we saw in some of the content management systems that we analyzed, you can basically disable the sandbox. For example, you can get the uh, class resolver for the default configuration that is non-sandboxed and then set that class resolver as the class resolver for the current and sandboxed configuration. So effectively disabling the, the sandbox and being able to execute the, uh, the old payload from James Kettle once again. So now we will be reviewing eight different ways to escape the sandbox and get remote code execution in LifeRay. Um, so let's see our LifeRay instance here. And what we will be doing is basically using this template. And here what we are going to do basically is, first of all, we are going to use the class loader uh, payload, uh, which will allow us to read the password file using the URL trick that we explained before. Then because the instance of the class loader is a web application class loader, we will be using that class loader to um, upload a web cell by using the write method. This will be available in the shell um, in the shell JSP file. Then we will be also using the web application class loader to get access to an instance manager and then instantiate arbitrary classes. In this case, we are instantiating an expression language processor and then running the ID process. Uh, then we will be also showing a different payload that depends on using an instance manager. This time is taken from the servlet context. And again, we are using the EL processor to run the ID command. And then we will be using um, a JSON deserializer as an instance manager in the sense that we will be um, using that to instantiate arbitrary types. We will be um, getting access to the JSON deserializer from the Spring application context. And because this JSON deserializer uses a whitelist and allow list here, we need to register or we can actually register any arbitrary types for us to use in the uh, in the JSON payload. So now by deserializing this JSON payload, we are um, effectively instantiating an EL processor and then again running the ID command. Same thing, uh, but instead of getting the JSON deserializer from the Spring Bean context, uh, LifeRay um, directly exposed this JSON factory util, which we can use to create a JSON deserializer and then once again use that to instantiate arbitrary types. And then uh, we will see the two uh, free market specific bypasses that we explained um, a few minutes ago. The first one is using the URL class loader. That is the case here because uh, LifeRay is deployed on, on Tomcat. And then we can um, basically access our own jar file, load it, and then by getting a public static field, uh, the class will be insta um, initialized and the payload will be executed. And uh, we will be able to check the output of this payload um, by checking the the standard output and the last payload that worked in life ray actually there's a couple more but um well it was more than enough um is this universal rc so we are loading the object wrapper interface loading the default wrapper field and then using that field to instantiate arbitrary types in this case the execute a type that we will be using to run the id so now if we save this template and we will be um, showing the results of these payloads. Uh, the first one was reading the password file. The second one was deploying a web cell that we can now access and run arbitrary commands. Uh, the third one was uh, using different methods to run the ID command. As you can see here, all of them worked. Uh, so also the URL class loader was basically running the static initializer block of this class, which is basically uh, printing pwn in the standard output console. We can check that. Uh, here it is. So it worked. And back to the payloads. Um, 
um, the universal RC payload also worked as we can see here. So switching to the velocity sandbox, uh, this one is based on a class and package based block list. So things like, for example, the whole JavaLang reflect package is uh, forbidden and you can get access to it. Um, all the methods in JavaLang class and class loader are also blocked and you cannot uh, use them. But when we review the implementation, we found that um, there is a flaw in the way that this sandbox is checking the, the block list. So for example, when you run the request cephalet and then you get access to a class loader and run the load class method, um, basically um, the execution of this method will be checked against the block list and the class name of the current class loader will be checked against the block list. Instead of checking the whole hierarchy of classes, only the current object class will be checked against the block list, which means that because JavaLang class loader is an abstract class, it won't never be the case that the current object class will be a JavaLang class loader. In this case, it's a parallel web app class loader, which is not present in the block list, and therefore class loader methods are effectively allowed. Um, there is a feature in, in Velocity which allows you to invoke a static methods from a, a JavaLang class object. So once that we are able to load a class, we can just invoke any static method and use that to get remote code execution easily. So now moving to JinJava Sandbox. Um, this one is um, based on a method block list. Uh, this is actually very short, only nine methods. And um, what it contains is a piece of code that is pretty effective in protecting the sandbox. So every time that a method invocation happens as part of the evaluation of the template, the result type will be checked. And if it's an instance of a JavaLang class, then it will throw an exception and it will refuse to uh, return a JavaLang class instance. By not being able to get in access to arbitrary classes, we are normally not able to get um, or to be able to instantiate arbitrary types. However, we found a flaw. Um, as you can see here, the invocation of a class cannot return a JavaLang class instance, but it can return an array of JavaLang classes or a map including JavaLang classes. So what we can do is find a method returning an array of classes and then accessing any arbitrary item of this array. So the second part of this bypass was basically being able to access a secret or hidden um, variable in the context that is called underscore 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 interpreter in lit speech. So by using this uh, hidden uh, variable, we were able to access a bunch of different objects, including all the uh, context objects. And we were able to use uh, those two parts to get um, an instance of a class loader. So as you can see here, we use the interpreter to get the context and from the context we got uh, all the functions and from the functions we got the underlying methods, which are inst instances of JavaLang reflect method. And this class contains this get parameter types method, which returns a Java, uh, um, an array of JavaLang classes. So as I explained before, uh, we are able to get an instance of any uh, um, an individual item of this array. And by doing that, we are finally getting an instance of a JavaLang class. From there, we can get the protection domain, get the class loader, and then initiate any um, class loader based attack. So last, uh, Pebble Sandbox, we were able to find a couple of bypasses that we reported to the maintainers. Unfortunately, they didn't have time to fix them on time. So we decided not to leak these um, bypasses yet. And we are uh, keeping them classified for a few months. Uh, so with that, we will switch um, back to Alexander, who will wrap up the talk with some uh, conclusions. Thank you, Alvaro. First of all, let's summarize our results after this research. More than 30 new vulnerabilities were found and reported to the vendor. More than 20 different products are affected. We can see their names on this slide. Based on these results, we can make the next conclusions. These are not the problems uh, of, of specific product or framework and content management system as a class should be on Red Team Radar. Templates for dynamic content that can be managed by user is the main target for such system. There are specific areas with higher risk from security point of view. It's a good idea to perform security review and testing for such places. Always try to reduce attack surface as much as you can. 
and stay safe.